our Bibles together, if we could, this evening and find the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading in verse 22, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, will be our text for our message tonight. If you would like uh, an outline, we do have some outlines available, and you can, uh, they're in the foyer, you can use those to follow along uh, with our message here tonight to give you uh, the outline and the perspective as we go through this lesson And so if you need an outline, we'll make sure that you get one. Chapter 5, verse number 22, it says this, verse 22, chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for all of your blessings that you've given to us. We're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to look at this wonderful passage of Scripture. And Lord, I I know that a message like this is very countercultural. And Lord, I know that your truth is, is more powerful than anything the world has to offer. And so, Lord, I pray you would help us to embrace your answer to the needs that we have in our marriage. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make good decisions tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are looking at biblical truths for marriage, and our theme is, Are We There Yet? And really, the idea has to do, where the illustration has to do with traveling. And for all of its adventure within international travel, it includes a tricky detail, and that is foreign currency. Additionally, currency can be difficult for us to understand. At the time of me studying for this message, the Canadian dollar is worth 80 cents U.S., one Canadian dollar is 60 cents, British pound, 60 on the British pound, and $60.49 for the Indian ruby, and one Canadian dollar is $5 in the Chinese yen. And, and really, when you're involved in international travel, if you've done much of international travel, then if you don't study the exchange rates when you go into a particular country, it's easy for you to become taken advantage of. It's easy for you to to get ripped off. The reality is if you forget to calculate the exchange rate, uh, then you, when you make a purchase, it's easy for you to pay too much. And so in marriage, we're using this as an illustration to really understand what I would call heart conversion. Heart conversion. And heart conversion is a lot like currency conversion. You know, when we think about it tonight, marriage is the perfect scenario for misunderstandings. And really, it's, it's not about I'm right and my spouse is wrong, 
but because I forgot to convert the real currency of my heart into the real currency of my spouse's heart. And this is what we're going to be looking at in this study tonight. We're going to look at this comparison of foreign currency, and we're going to look at the differences tonight between a husband and a wife, and we're going to learn God's instruction to help us to meet the needs of our spouse. And so if you're taking notes tonight, would you write down number one, currency differences. Number one is currency differences. Now, for all of the sameness that attracted you and your spouse together, really at the end of the day, there is this, this pesky fact that the overriding attraction was rooted in what made you different. And what made you different, of course, I'm talking about man versus woman. And God, God speaks of the differences when God created male and female. He said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. We, we have to understand, and I'm sure we, we understand, that that men and women are different. And the differences that I'm talking about, it's deeper than just biological differences. When we talk about the fact that men and women are different, we're talking about how we feel, how we think, how we respond. We're, we're talking about the deepest needs of our hearts. Men and women are different. Now on the surface, some of these differences are easily explained and, you know, personality types and, and, and these are explained in backgrounds and life experiences. But I'm talking tonight about something deeper than all of that. I'm talking about something that God has embedded into the very makeup of a man and a woman. And so we're going to look at that tonight and what the Bible has to say about it. But first of all, before we get into the differences... I want us to understand this principle, letter A in our notes, that it's all about the same grace. It's all about the same grace. Before we can explore really the differencing, the differing needs between husbands and wives, I think we need to emphasize the valuable truth that under God, that we are experiencing the same grace. Now, there's a wonderful passage of Scripture. I want us to turn there if we could. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 7. They simply happen to have different currencies. But I think that we can understand that we are under God. We are on level ground. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers are not hindered. You see, the Bible teaches us that the ground is level at the cross. In Christ, the husband and wife have equal value. They have equal standing before God. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 7, that they are heirs together of God's grace. And it is this togetherness and grace that is one of the greatest joys in a Christian marriage. Colossians in the book of Galatians teaches us this very truth. I want us to turn to Colossians chapter 3. If you turn there, Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 11. Colossians chapter 3 and, and verse number 11. The Bible says in verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 3, if we could. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. 
Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, the Bible says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, we have to understand this principle that when we speak of the differences in needs and responsibilities and roles between a husband and a wife, in marriage, we are not talking about the difference in intrinsic value. The Bible makes it clear that, that we are all equal and valuable to God. And this is not what the world would say, you know, man versus woman, husband versus wife. This, this is not that at all. We are simply referring to the fact that differences between men and women, husbands and wives go deeper than the obvious surface differences. Now, remember this. As human beings, we are all equal value because all of us tonight are made in the image of God. We are all made in the image of God. As born-again believers, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior today, and I hope you do, then all of us today have equal standing with God. The Bible says that we are heirs, with His grace. But in marriage, there is these varying needs. And there's these varying responsibilities. A good marriage is one in which both spouses understand and fulfill those needs. And, and so we understand there are, let her be, different needs. There's different needs. Now, there's four main passages of Scripture in the New Testament that address both husbands and wives. And it's interesting that the three of these highlight the differences in roles and the differences in the responsibilities between a husband and wife in marriage. And yet God gives specific instruction to wives and instruction to husbands in these passages of Scripture, their roles, their responsibilities, and their needs. I want us to look at them. We highlighted them in the book of Ephesians, but let's notice again, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 33. The Bible says this, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. In 1 Peter chapter 3, let's turn there if we could. 1 Peter chapter 3. And notice what the Bible says in verse number 7. 1 Peter chapter 3. The Bible says this, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, the wording of each of these passages of Scripture are different, but the meaning is always the same. God gives to us the needs of each spouse. And we notice in this passage of Scripture that wives are to give reverence or respect to their husband, and husbands are to give love. This is what the Bible says. By the way, this is not my opinion. This is what God is saying. You're going to have to understand, this is, this is not me giving a seminar on marriage and how to fix it. This is God telling you how marriage works. And God is saying that they, these are the needs of each spouse. The need of a husband is respect, and the need of a wife is love. It is the universal need of a woman that she feel loved. Now, I understand that marriage is built on the committed love, and we would expect to have love within a marriage, and I'm not saying that a husband doesn't need love. They absolutely do. But the Bible teaches us that women need the assurance of love. They need their husbands to express this love tenderly, 
and often in their life. And it's also, the Bible says, a universal need that a husband feel respected. Once again, both men and women need and deserve respect. But the Bible teaches us that men have that deep need in their heart for respect. In the same way that a wife needs her husband to express a sacrificial love, the Bible says a husband needs his wife to express committed respect. So I want us to notice number two. Let's break this down even further. Number two, let's notice currency types. Currency types. Now, I find it interesting, and obviously God is the one who's the author of the Bible, and he knows what he's doing. I find it interesting that these needs really correspond with the biblical roles of men and women in marriage. The Bible says husbands are to provide leadership and are commanded to to nurture and cherish their wife. Look what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it uh, to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. A wife giving respect to her husband enables him to fulfill God's purpose in his life. And the Bible says that wives are to support their husbands by following their leadership and demonstrating a peaceable spirit. Look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's turn there if we could. I, I, I need you to see this from the Bible Let's look at what the Bible says here. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, it means here if there's a husband that is not a Christian, They also may without the word be one, or they may come to Christ by the conversation. This speaks of more than just the words we say, but the life we live of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be with the outward adorning of plaiting of hair and wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. A husband freely and frequently should demonstrate tender love to his wife, and provide the security that she needs in her role. Of course, at the end of the day, in a healthy marriage, no one really has to make the choice between love and respect. Both spouses give both to each other. And yet the Bible, knowing the hearts of each spouse, gives these specific commands related to marriage and really highlights the greatest need of each. And I believe it, it teaches us and, and teaches us the greatest challenge that each spouse has to give to the other. Now, listen, I understand our culture has completely resisted this truth. And our culture would say that, you know, this is stereotypical, that this is old-fashioned, this is the way that life was But at the end of the day, they would say, oh, this is even oppressive. But listen, at the end of the day, this is not oppressive. This is how God established marriage. Think about this for just a moment. You buy a new car. And 
You love that car. You're taking care of that car. And then you have a problem with that car. So what do you do? You open up your glove department, you pull out your manual, and you start looking at the manual for answers. Now there's no time in your heart are you thinking that the manufacturer wrote this manual to be malicious. You're not thinking that there's any time when when, when the manufacturer wrote this manual so that your car would be less pleasant to drive. At the end of the day, you read the manual because you believe it's going to make your car last longer and the experience of driving it will be better. And the same is true with marriage. You know, at the end of the day, if someone has a problem with Genesis 1-1 in the beginning God, then they're going to have a problem with the entire Bible. And the Bible teaches us that this is God's pattern for marriage. God has called a husband to provide a loving servant leadership in the home, and he has called a wife to give honor and submission to her husband. And following the roles that God embedded into the creation of marriage is an integral part of us enjoying marriage the way God intended it to work. To reject these thoughts is to reject God's plan for marriage. You know, I think, you know, people who would say, I don't believe that Ephesians 5 teaches how to have a good marriage. Those same people want the Ephesians 5 marriage. Deep down in their heart, that's the marriage they want. That's, that's where their heart aches. They want what God says. They want the product, but they don't want the process. And so God knows what he's talking about. Both deep in their heart, they understand their deepest needs. A wife desires love. And a husband craves respect. Now, remember this, when it comes to these, these roles, these are not selfish roles. We don't study this passage of Scripture so that our spouse can do a better job relating to us. At the end of the day, the goal is that you know how to give grace and love to one another in the currency, the currency that they most readily use and understand. And so... Buckle your seatbelts, because <laughs> we're going to look at these currencies and what the Bible has to say. Now, I find it, it interesting as well, in Ephesians chapter 5, remember that prior to the verses that we read about marriage, God gave a command for us to yield to the Holy Spirit. It says in Ephesians 5 verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So we have to understand that what we're talking about here is not something that, goes, that, that comes natural. In order for us to fill, fulfill these roles, these God-given roles, we are going to have to have not a natural response, not a carnal response, but we're going to have to have a godly response. And God says, listen, if you're going to have a right marriage, then first of all, you need to yield to the Holy Spirit in your life. James 4 verse 6 says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you want grace in your marriage? Then you're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to humble yourself. And so let's, let's notice tonight a husband's currency. The Bible says that a, a husband's currency is respect, is respect. And that is why God instructs wives to demonstrate respect. The Bible says, Ephesians 5, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. This passage of Scripture is, is so important 
as it really begins what we would call the, the, the starting point of this marriage relationship. The Greek word translated submit here is the idea to arrange under. It, it means to submit one's self. And the thought of the passage of Scripture is that this is a voluntary submission. This is a willing choice that the wife will submit to her husband. I, I love what Joyce Rogers wrote about this relation to the wife's role in marriage. She said this, to prove submission is a wonderful concept. She said, Jesus became the ultimate illustration of this. Although He was co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, He was completely submissive to the Father's will. And so submission doesn't make a husband better than the wife because Jesus submitted to the Father. And yet we're not talking about we're not talking about worth here. We're talking about roles. A godly wife chooses to submit to and honor her husband's leadership and an expression of her trust in the Lord. This is a faith issue. This is a faith issue. The Bible says that she is to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. But she also does it as an expression of her love because this is the currency of a husband. You know, perhaps in part because of the responsibility of, of a husband to be the leader in the home, a way a husband most feels loved is when his wife communicates willingness to follow his leadership and communicate her respect for him as a person. And, and wives struggle with this. Our society has painted this picture that, that respect is something that you earn by proving yourself. And, and we speak often of the importance of unconditional love, and yet we don't speak often about the importance of respect within a marriage. Listen, both love and respect are due to every person because they are made in the image of God. But a wife is not expected to respect her husband for something he is not. At the end of the day, listen, God doesn't want you to lie to your husband, and He doesn't want you to lie to yourself. You, you know, at the end of the day, pretending that He has arrived in areas that He hasn't, listen, this is not what God is talking about. But listen, don't let this stop you from, from respecting Him for who He is. And in particular, who He is, is your husband. Is your husband. The Bible doesn't teach that all women are supposed to submit to all men. But it does teach that a wife is to voluntarily place herself under the leadership of her husband, and that this and that this is pleasing unto the Lord. Turn with me to Colossians chapter three. Would you turn there? Colossians chapter three and verse number eighteen. Colossians chapter three, verse eighteen. It says this wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, listen to me. This doesn't mean that a wife is not also her husband's partner. This doesn't mean that a wife is not to share in ideas and concerns and input with one another as they work toward decisions. That is not what the Bible is teaching. But in the larger picture, God has ordained this plan for the home that the husband is the leader and the wife has the spirit to follow his leadership. This is what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, would you turn there? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I expected more amens from men here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3. The Bible says this, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, 
And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. A wife who gives respect to her husband isn't in any way less than her husband. Understand that. She is communicating love to him in a way that he deeply, that, that deeply meets the needs of his heart. But not only is a man's currency respect, but the Bible says a woman's currency is love. The currency a wife most needs and understands, gentlemen, is love. And that is why God instructs husbands to demonstrate this love. Husbands, love your wives. Isn't it sad that God has to tell us to love our wives? But this is the deepest need of a woman. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he may present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or sprinkle or any such thing. But they should be holy and without blemish. So men, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth nourish and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Oftentimes, men, we, we think of physical provision that we offer to our families. We think putting food on the table or putting a car in the driveway or you know, fixing the washer machine if it's broken. You, you know, we, we look at these and we say we're fulfilling our responsibilities in, in marriage. And, and don't get me wrong, our role as provider is important. A wife needs more than just physical provision, the Bible says. She needs this frequent expressions of affection and, and love. And because we live in a sin-cursed world, we, we have such a flawed image of love. It's such a, a, a corrupt image of what love is in our world that, that God has to tell us directly what this love looks like. God says, gentlemen, I want to tell you what this type of love looks like. First of all, it looks like sacrifice. The love that I'm talking about is not what this world has to offer. This is, this is a sacrificial love. And he uses the illust illustration of what Christ did on the cross. This, this is the kind of love that I want you to have for your wife. This, this surpasses the normal marital love that even the unsaved world would know. It, it's a love that is not, you know, you do this and I'll do that, and you do this and I'll do that. No, this is a sacrificial love, the love of Christ. The Bible says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But also this is a serving love. Because Christ came to serve. You call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your master, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you, to serve. This is the love of Christ, to serve. Dr. Daniel Kim, he pastored, uh, has been pastoring the Bible Baptist Church in Korea for over 50 years. He shared the story of when he asked his prospective father-in-law for his daughter, Young Soon's hand in marriage. Before answering Dr. Kim, his father-in-law, which also has the last name of Kim, told him a story from almost 20 years later. During the Korean War, he and his family were fleeing from what is now North Korea to the south. And during the Korean War, he said it was a journey of many miles made completely by foot and mostly under cover of darkness. Young Soon, now Dr. Kim's wife, was very young and would often cry. And this was a great danger to herself, but not only, not only to herself, it was a great danger to the entire group. And so the group had come together and they had insisted that Mr. Kim separate from them for their safety. 
And so he told the story that he continued on without them, carrying young Soon the entire journey to the south. As Mr. Kim finished the story, he looked at the young man asking for his daughter's hand in marriage. And he said, I risked my life for her. He said, she is my most treasured possession. You may marry her if you promise to love her like this. Most of us know nothing of the kind of sacrificial love that Jesus gave to us. And gentlemen, the Lord knows that we're not that smart. <laughs> and so he made it real simple for us. He says, I'm going to even make it easier for you to understand this type of love. He says, listen, gentlemen, why don't you just love her like you love yourself? Why don't you just love her like you love your own flesh? The ego of man is legendary. We think so much of ourselves, gentlemen, and God tells us, listen, you know how to love yourself, love your wife like you love you, and you'll be okay. My husbands and wives have equal value to God. They have different needs and different roles within marriage. Embracing these roles and learning how to meet the other's needs allows both to give to the other in a way that is valuable to both spouses. All right, thirdly, and I'll be done, currency conversions. Currency conversions. Now, again, we've been using the comparison of currency conversions as an illustration of meeting each other's needs. And, you know, when traveling internationally, the sooner you understand and learn the, the figure of currency conversion, the more you enjoy your travel abroad. And, and this really is true with marriage as well. And, and, and I hope you understand where I'm going with this because in many ways, marriage is a lifelong journey of exchanging the currencies of love and respect. And, and this is what God lays out for us to help us to understand. It is the husband purposely learning to convert the respect that he feels to his wife to loving words and actions. And and it's the wife learning to convert the love she feels for her husband into honoring words and actions. Because so many times a wife will think, well, you know, what my deepest need is, it, my, what my deepest need is, is love. And so I'm going to give that love to my husband. But what his deepest need is respect. And the opposite is true. A husband will say, well, I'm going to give my wife respect, but her deepest need is love. And so ha there has to be that conversion as we meet the needs of our spouses. In the book, Love and Respect, the love that she most desires and respect he desperately needs, uh, the, the author calls this scenario the crazy cycle. A husband is demanding to his wife and she in turn cuts him down so she feels unloved and then feels disrespected. And unless one of them will break the cycle, their responses tend to escalate into unloving, disrespectful ways. In reality, both spouses want the opposite of what they are refusing to give. And we understand that a Christ-like attitude, a Christ-like attitude, especially to our spouse, does not emphasize rights over responsibilities. At the end of the day, we want to show grace. The Bible teaches us that we must show our spouse grace. And within that grace, a woman craves love and a man respect. And so I want to give you letter A in our notes, demonstrating respect. I want to give you some thoughts here. And uh, these are just some practical examples of how um, how a woman can uh, demonstrate respect to her husband. And these may seem very self-serving, uh, but understand that these were written by a woman. They are not written by me. And so these are real-life examples of a wife over her experience of how she has met the needs of her husband throughout the years. And, and number one, I'll go through these rather quickly. Number one is just give genuine acceptance. Give genuine acceptance. Refuse to try to change your husband. Respect how God has made him. 
his, his physical characteristics, his, his personality, and even his quirks. And, and understand that we are completely accepted in Christ Jesus. All right? The Bible says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Number two, support his decisions. Support his decisions. Give your input during the decision-making process. Uh, but even when he makes a decision that goes against your better judgment, support him by doing your best to work toward a good outcome uh, on that decision. And when the decision your husband makes does, not, uh, does have a negative outcome, then avoid saying, I told you so. Your, wife, your husband knows you told him so. Okay, You don't have to remind him of that. But continue to support him. Continue to support him. Though, you know, even through the frustrating aftermath, because this is going to, uh, this is going to help him in a powerful way. And then also be his recreational partner. You know, um, maybe early in your marriage, you spent time maybe watching a football game or a hockey game together or whatever your husband enjoys to do. You know, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, men are more event-oriented, more action-oriented, and most of the time, women are more conversation-oriented. Um, and, and, and though maybe a, a, a long, deep conversation may show, you know, wives, it may show you love, but it's not the same uh, with your husband. And so choosing to spend time with him doing what he enjoys is going to help him feel validated and loved. And then also pray for your husband's success. Pray for your husband's success. You know your husband's weaknesses more than anyone. My wife knows my weaknesses more than anyone here. And, and don't make those the focus of your prayers for him. Pray for his success, not for his changing. You know, there may be a time that in his life he has a blind spot and you need to come to the Lord and pray and ask God to reveal this to him. But primarily pray for God to bless him and God to give him good success in his life. You know, think about this. This is a, a wonderful practical thought. If you spend your time in prayer for your husband, thinking about all the needs that he needs to improve, then you will leave your place of prayer with a stronger desire to change him than to support him. And the opposite is true. If you spend your time thanking God for his strengths and praying for his success, then you leave prayer with a heart to be part of those answers. And so pray for his success. Praise him publicly and privately. Don't, don't cut him down in public. Don't criticize him in public. You know, our, our society today, men are so cut down. Men are so mocked. I, I mean, sitcoms today shows a man as a wimp and a guy who knows nothing and a guy who is frail and, and can do nothing in this world. That's how society paints a man today. And, and when you verbalize praise, ladies, this is incredible attractive to a man. A simple note left in your sock drawer, honey, thank you for being such a hard worker. I admire you. It's like a windfall of respect currency to a man. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may Minister grace unto the hearers. Don't criticize, don't backbite, don't go to other people and, and criticize your husband. Praise him and praise him also not only in public but also in private. And then I want us to think about some thoughts about demonstrating love. How can a husband demonstrate this, this love currency to their to their wives. You say, well, oh, Pastor Burns, it's easy. I just tell my wife I love her. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, there's far more to it than that. Number one, seek to understand her. Seek to understand her. Get to know your wife. Study what her needs are, as well as what she likes and what she dislikes, her preferences. The Bible says husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. And this takes effort, gentlemen, and this takes work. It takes work. It doesn't just happen. It takes effort. Also, take initiative in the spiritual matters of your home. God has made you the leader of your home. 
And I find it sad, you know, when the husband is at home playing video games and the, the mother is carrying all the children to church. That's a sad place in our society. A husband's leadership in the home isn't just about financial decisions. It is to, to also be a, a spiritual support in the home as well. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Even if your personality, gentlemen, isn't you know, a, a born leader, then, then you can still be proactive in the spiritual growth of, of you and your spouse and your family. And then also give and communicate security. I remember many, many years ago, Pastor Clayton was the pastor here at the church. I was the assistant pastor, and there was a gentleman who was having marital problems, and he was talking with me, and he was wondering what he was doing wrong. And I find out several weeks later that him and his wife would have an argument, and, and he would say to her, I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to leave you. I'm, gonna, I'm leaving right now. And uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't bring security in the heart of a woman. A, heart, a, a wife needs that security. The Bible says, but if any provide not for his own, and, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith, uh, faith and is worth, worse than an infidel. This is more than just you know, being a provider of physical things, of financial things, a, a home and all of these things. This, this is to provide security in your home. And your wife needs that security. That security is a part of love. And you need to express to her that love. Listen, if, if you leave the house, gentlemen, your wife should never, ever have the thought that you're not coming back. Never have that thought. You should, have, you should plant in her heart that security, that, that trust in you. And so the Bible says that here that we should be a provider for our house. And this, again, is security, emotional security. This is spiritual security. And then also spend time together as a family. I, I, I don't mean you have to drive to Disneyland, but, but spend time. Spend time with your spouse. Spend time with your wife. You know, go to the park for the day. Take some time and play some games. But spend time. Spend time and then communicate appreciation for who she is. You know, even when it comes to communicating appreciation for what she does, we fall short. But your wife wants to know you love her regardless of what she does for you. When was the last time you said to her, sweetheart, I just want you to know that no matter what happens, I'm always going to be grateful that you let me be your husband. Thank you for being the amazing person that you are. The, these, of course, are just small suggestions. And it goes far beyond this. And I know our time is up and we spent most of our lesson describing the challenges and, and remember, remembering the, the currency of the heart. But listen, I want to end with, with a simple thought here. Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter what currency you have. It doesn't matter if you have pesos or dollars or pounds or yens. None of this matters. It doesn't even matter if you have monopoly money today. It doesn't buy anything unless you use it. It doesn't matter what country you are in or the exchange rate or how well you know currency exchange. If the money stays in your pocket, it has no value to you at all. And I want to encourage you tonight, this is your homework, I want to encourage you tonight to spend your currency on your spouse. Don't just think about love and respect. Don't just consider the ways you want your spouse to show you love and respect. And don't be so concerned about not knowing how to make you know, conversions that you keep it in your pocket. Listen, friends, go ahead and spend it. Show your spouse the love that she needs and, and wives, show your husband the respect that he craves. Giving love and respect to your spouse is the best way you can invest in your marriage. Let's pray.
Lord, thank you so much for your word, Lord. And, and I know, Lord, that this is a, a message that is contrary to what the world teaches and what the world says. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us to shun the noise around us and to focus our attention on your truth and your word and give us understanding, Lord. Teach us how to love and respect. And Lord, I pray for our marriages. I know the devil is, is fiercely attacking the